I had a meeting with um my job. Right. And we I was telling them, Oh, I'm at work. <laughs> Well, I'm on vacation. <laughs> Must be nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, apparently there are now sites where you can download background images for mm -hmm. Zoom meetings. Let's do, just Google quickly cubicles. Um, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay, let's get started. Um, are there any questions? I do have a question. Okay. I did. I did not see the video from last week online and. I want to just make sure it was there. I looked earlier today. Um, yeah, I forgot to put it on. I uploaded it to, but I forgot to put it on. I did put it on later this afternoon. Um, and I don't, um, the day we did people talking about the class, and projects, I don't put that online because people um, identify them by name. So they all should be there now. Uh, good, thanks. And we're reaching the end of the semester. Um, there's three weeks of class left. I have a few topics to talk about. Um, like I said earlier, I usually leave the last two weeks the class for office hours for people to talk about the projects and to give people more time to work on the projects. Um, also gives me time to get caught up on all my grading. So oh. let's, um, okay, so one more question. Okay. Did you grade our midterm? Uh, I haven't looked. Not yet. That's the next thing on my list. Um, I should get to it this Friday. Okay, thanks. Now share my screen. Whenever I do that, my chat window goes away. And my list of people goes away. Okay, so now I'm back. So I got some miscellaneous topics to talk about. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is um, web browser, web view. Um, both iOS and Android have a um, view that you can use, which will render web pages. Um, And you know it's you add to the view and do find by or use column magic to get to it. Um, and you can tell it to upload or you know call fetch a web page and it'll display it. Um, now there's a reason I don't talk about this until towards the end of the class, is, and that is. There's always a few students get really excited and say, oh, can I can just build an application and it'll just be a web page, right? And there'll be three views and there'll be different web pages. And um, my reaction is, well, no, you don't want to do that. Um, 
if it's just going to be a web page, then why bother? Just make it given the URLs, right? Um, the web view, you know, it does most of the things you want to do. It can render CSS, handle JavaScript. It can deal with cookies. Um, you know, HTML5, page browsing, browser history, so you can go back. Um, and more interestingly, you can actually um, literally um, render images in JavaScript and HTML locally, right? So here is just I'm getting my reference my web view. I'm creating a very, very small uh, page, HTML page, and then I'm just loading it directly into that web view. All right, so. And yeah, there's, you can deal with various issues. Um, so when you, when you have, um, um, here I'm creating, you know, a class in Java, and then you convert it to Kotlin. Um, Running web and giving it um, JavaScript interface. Um, now, once I've done that, again, I get my web view. I can now add JavaScript right to my project inter interface. Um, and now, um, I can create this particular um, HTML and render it and just on click, right, which is a regular uh, HTML thing one does, right, will render, will work, right, in the web view. So I, I click on that uh, button. It's going to right call show Android toast, um, and there's my show Android toast, and it's going to then call Android show toast, and right that's calling this function I created over here. Right? So I can actually have JavaScript in this crazy web view, which is calling my Java or Kotlin code. So far, so good. Pretty good. Yeah, good. Hi, somebody wants to get into the Zoom. Oh, okay, right. Thank you. Right. So why is this important? Um, There are a number of reasons why it's important. Um, one is um, we can actually make part of our native application um, be HTML JavaScript, right? So I can create a small little sub view, um, make it a web view, and display a button or JavaScript. Um, and the interesting, the, the interesting thing that all this would do is um, if it's rendering HTML and CSS and JavaScript, um, my application in the background can go and download that from the server um, for changes, right? So I can now have part of my page 
being modified dynamically based upon things on the server without having to go through the app store approval process. Um, and so it's one way to do A-B testing on a application. Um, you create part of it using you know, small pieces of HTML. Um, and then for some customers, when your application connects to the server, ask for updates, so they'll get we give a one version, other people get other versions, and you can see how they respond. Um, another reason this is important is that we can now build an entire application just using HTML and CSS and JavaScript. Um, so this particular screenshot is um, an application written completely in HTML um, and CSS, and it's um, packaged in a native application. And this is um, now. The reason is, well, um, ever since um, iPhone came out and built applications for it, um, a lot of people have been arguing that um, this is what you want to do for a couple of reasons. One is currently to build applications, there's two platforms that support. Android and iOS, and they use different languages and uh, different frameworks, um, which means you either need two separate teams um, or you need one team that knows both. Regardless, you're going to create two different code bases, and that kind of is slightly different in each one. Um, whereas if we can build the thing in, in CSS, um, and then wrap it in a native application so people can download it from the app store. Um, you've got one code base, or maybe one main code base with two small pieces for different platforms to make it work right. Um, so you'll save a lot of time and a lot of effort. And if you're a business person, you save your money. Um, Um, go ahead. Somebody else is also waiting to get in the class. Me too. I've got one, two, three, I've got five windows and monitoring in there. Now I moved it. I just not bend over to one of my cameras and I look at try and look at you instead of looking talking to someone over here. I'll, I'll see them. Um, right, so we get various systems now which allow us to do this, where we can actually um, build the application just using HTML. JavaScript and CSS. Um, like I said, the development language either we're dealing with Swift or Kotlin, Swift or Java. Um, this idea of building cross platform native mobile apps. Um, We're going to build one code base ones on multi platforms. Um, you know, Bada never came, never 
came out. Sailfish still exists, but it's such a small market that no one's ever heard of it. Um, so we're still primarily looking at currently Android and iPhone. Um, so a lot of bad people have been right, advocating this where we, we make our entire app using different web views, we wrap inside of a native application, and we have one code base and we send it off the App Store, the iOS App Store, or the Android App Store. There are a number of different systems to do this. There's quite a few actually. Um, one of the older ones is PhoneGap. Um, and that is exactly what I'm outlining. Is you develop everything using HTML and, and JavaScript. And then they wrap it in a web view. And then they use a sort of bridge to talk to OS. Um, Titanium operates slightly differently. You do primarily develop in JavaScript, but it compiles it down. Um, so we're not necessarily dealing with the bridge. Xamarin, which is using, you know, is now a Microsoft product, um, uses C sharp. And again, it, it does not use the same approach. It compiles it down to some bytecode, and then use that bytecode to either run an iOS, you know, convert to iOS or convert it to Android. Um, React Native from you know, Facebook. Um, again, you develop everything in JavaScript, um, but it's compiled down to native machine code for iOS and Android. So we're not going through a web view, but we're all, we are writing things in JavaScript. Uh, Kotlin is also working on a system called Kotlin Native. Um, and they've got pieces which are run on various platforms. I haven't looked at this recently. You see how well it runs, but it is possible to build applications for iOS using Kotlin, right? So here's just a you know, small piece of Kotlin code that we can run and it compiles on iOS. Does React Native still use the JSX files? Um, I don't, I don't, I haven't looked at it recently, so I'm not sure what you're using. Okay. It's, I don't think it's one of the more popular ways of doing it. Um, in part because there are many alternatives um, which come from better known companies or bigger companies. Um, you know, React Native is one, Cameron, another one from Microsoft. Um, and the third one is Flutter from Google. So here it is um, Flutter is another one. Um, and here is the same application running on iOS and Android. I've got the same, I've got one IDE, one editor running, and it outputs the simulator for Android and a simulator for iOS. Um, exact same code, no changes. Although, um, when you build more complicated applications, you may have to, you can drop down and do some native um, work on Android or iOS. Now Flutter is a very interesting system and 
help understand why Flutter, um, we need to talk about Fuchsia. Um, for some reason, which Google has not fully explained, uh, Google is now creating a third operating system that they support. The first two are Android on mobile devices and Chrome OS on notebooks. Um, they really got Chromebooks. So Fuchsia is um, in a third operating system they've been developing for a number of years. Um, it's primarily targeted for mobile devices. Um, so you know, run on smartphones and tablets and PCs, et cetera. Um, and you use Slider to create um, application UI and applications on Fuchsia. Um, They haven't spoken much about the what they plan on doing with this. Um, one has to be somewhat careful of Google because they're, you know, they earn enough money, they can have a big project and, and spend a lot of money on it and then decide to throw it away. Um, but they continue to develop on Fuchsia. It's not clear, you know, if these are hmm, happening, mm -hmm. there we go. if our target are smartphones and tablets, um, we haven't explained yet how they plan to make that work, given that Android is so popular around the world. Um, they expect manufacturers to drop Android. Um, or not, or support a separate system. Um, well, the motivation for making Flutter work on Android and iOS is to attract developers. Um, and then once sometime in the near future or distant future, when they actually come out with future devices, then those applications are going to be easily ported to uh, Fuchsia devices. Um, right, so it's, you know, currently, um, you know, Flutter will generate application run iOS, Android, Fuchsia, of course, but no one's got Fuchsia device. Um, and you can also build web pages now with it, although that's still in beta. Um, they use a language um, called Dart. And Dart was a language Created um, at Google, and it was initially it was meant as a replacement for JavaScript. Um, so it's designed to be very efficient, so um, it can run fast and consume a few resources, um, and take care of some of the ugly parts of um, JavaScript. And for a while, Google is trying to get people to embed a Dart VM in a web browser, um, but even Chrome team wouldn't do it. So Dart, you can use Dart to build web pages directly. There is a um, Dart to JavaScript compiler. Um, And a couple of things, um, Flutter is reactive. It, we've seen, seen a little bit of reactive when we deal with um, live data, um, room, et cetera. 
There is no GUI builder, which is now the trend. Um, Apple's um, Swift UI does not use a GUI builder. Um, you know, Android's up and coming um, Compose does not use a GUI builder to build GUI interfaces. And if you're tired of having to recompile your code and then have a simulator, um, it has live updates of code changes, which is sort of nice. Um, so here's an example. And again, I'm you know running the same code on Android and iOS device. And now when I change the name, notice that um, it propagates now that the name has changed up here. Now I'm going to change the color to green and select green color. And now to make that run, I have to hot reload. Um, it happens pretty fast. Turn back to red, and you're going to red. Um, and you see one updated, so there's a slight problem. Um, but the updates happen a lot, lot faster. Um, And no surprise that the Android version works a little better than the iOS version um, in this case. Well, this demo is a year old, so this thing didn't move too long since then. And a Flutter device to start doing, you know, the create interface all in code. Um, right, so it's, you know, send the title, the theme you want to use, right. Then we add state. Um, and again, when the state changes, any view that depends on the state is updated automatically. All right, so here I'm, I'm changing counter by two. Um, but I'm not worrying about what happens after the, any view that uses state while it make update. The same way we can do with. Um, live data uh, in Android. All right, so we, we, you'll see the, the same approach now in multiple um, applications. Um, React Native does this. Um, we're getting it in iOS. Um, Microsoft components do the same thing, search the same thing. And then, you know, here's how we put it together. Um, this is run every time the state updates. So one one important lesson. Um, the takeaway point here is that this course has spent, you know, learning Kotlin and learning the native APIs for, for Android to build an Android application. It's not the only way to build applications for Android. Um, there are other ways we can do it, which will give us um, you know, an easier path to 
also have run the same application on iOS. Now, typically, um, when you do that, you lose something. Um, you may not have access to the latest features of new version of iOS comes out and it comes out. Um, running your application in JavaScript in a web view is going to be slower than uh, running Kotlin code or Java code on Android. Um, also, it depends upon how fast the device is and how complicated the operation you're doing, right? Um, for most simple things, it's going to be plenty fast. If you're doing something complicated, involved, it, you might notice the site slow down. Um, so these days, um, you know, for simple applications, um, people might tend to use a cross-platform um, application instead of developing natively in iOS or Android. The other thing you tend to lose is if you're doing the application in a web view, um, the application is not going to look exactly like an iOS application does. It won't look exactly like an Android application does. And the web, you know, HTML and JavaScript tends up that's slightly different functionality and different ways of operating. So the applications um, just don't feel native, which may or may not be a problem depending upon your user base. But I just think it's important that people realize these, are, these options do exist. Um, and next semester, I'll be teaching a course looking at some of the options and going into far more detail than I did here. Okay, any questions? Okay, so far so good. Um, some very information about strings. Um, Android applications come with, you know, your Boto font. Um, you know, there's various standard sizes we can use. Um, you know, again, various color schemes, right? White text on black, um, black text on white. Um, and the secondary color, which is you know, slightly gray. You know, various information about fonts, whether it's, you know, without serifs, with serifs, read a mono, mono space, um, and then the standard styles. And how we indicate the sizes. Is there any time we want? We can specify what typeface we want to use, um, the size. Um, you can use other fonts if you want. If you can have to install the fonts in your project, then you can use them. Um, so you're not limited to the standard um, Android font. We can also do the standard um, Java slash Kotlin technique of using formatted strings. Um, you know, so here um, I'm creating a string with variables in it and providing the values for that. Um, and the resulting string um, replaces it. That can be useful at times when you want to embed 
numbers and strings, and this can be done in Android. Um, we can also um, use positional, so I'm indicating what the, what the position. So this is take the second one and put it here, and the second one is three. So three goes there, and this is this new one. So the two all right, goes there. And we're going to do this in right, this thing resources file. So I can, um, you know, here's the standard greeting um, using positions, and then I supply the, the variables, the actual instance for them. Okay, so that's and then we're going to do the same thing. You know, we, we can do that um, rather template, fill it in. Um, And then set the text um, in those in those views. Uh, I have a question about the string. You say percent two dollar s. What it, what's the dollar sign for? So that's like right here. Yeah. Um, so there's two pieces, right? There's a percent two. Um, that means I'm going to I have to give you all the variables, and so the second variable is going to get put the value here. Um, here, the dollar sign s um, turns it into so treat it as a string. So this whole thing says, okay, that's which variable we want and treat it as a string and put it right here, convert to a string. I expect it to be a string, right? Here again, this one's a string, and but this one is a decimal number. Answer your question. So that means in the case of the number, it converts the number to a string? Correct, correct. Okay. And the S and the D are um, pretty standard um, formatting characters in um, In Java. All right, again, it's not a major thing, but it's you know a small little detail that patient might find useful to be able to embed um, values into a, a string. And the reason for using these positions right, is that when you nationalize your string, um, different languages place words in different orders. So um, you want to make sure you use positions in that case. Because you never know when you call this, when you provide the parameters um, in your code, you don't know which language is being used, so you don't know what order to use. So you 
um, want to make sure that right in your string resource you specify which variable goes in which location for using these positions. You can um, do some simple formatting of strings um, uh, using you know, some of the standard HTML tags, bold, italic, small, big, subspecific script in your strings. And to read those in the string, the skip text. Um, and you get a, a char sequence. And basically, you can either do the Install this text or you can do formatting, but you don't want, you don't want to do both because it gets really, you can't do things like this. Um, and like I said earlier, you can use the web view to. Um, Display a small part of your screen. And so you can use it just to display text, right? And so what I'm doing here is I'm creating a little HTML um, document which only is used to render you know one sentence. Um, and that can be done. If you want to do some techniques that you, you can do in HTML but are harder to do in, in, in Android or Kotlin. Okay. Um, the text I've talked about this, I haven't, I haven't at this point. Um, we can define various styles and reuse them. Um, right, so here I'm defining a style called Big Red, um, specifying you know font size and color red, um, and then in my in my, in my text view. I can specify the style of text to be big red. Um, if you're building an application, um, typically you, you want to pick themes, you know, colors that work together, text that work together, sizes that work together, um, and define them. And then using the styles so that um, if you change your mind and you want to change some default colors, um, you can do that in one place as opposed to having it defined every place you specify this color or this size of font. Um, and a style can cover almost everything. Um, and to find out exactly and go to the documentation, look up the UI element class, and look at all those of the XML attributes. And those are the things that you can define in your style or add to the style. Um, There are existing styles, um, right? So 
asking for Android style, um, large, you know, large text. You can also do this now, you do this, when you go to Android Studio on your left pane, right, you can open the text field and, and specify a style and a theme. Um, Right, and so here, right, we're gonna, we're gonna apply a theme. Um, here's the style to apply to the whole connectivity or entire application. Um, you know, Android comes with a number of themes, right? So here I'm creating a new style, there's Android light, you know, theme light. Um, that's the parent one, and I can I can add my own customization. You know, maybe I want different different colors, so like different font sizes. Um, right. Try and create you can create your own style, modify different styles and themes. Um, there's a list of them. So any questions, we move on to the third topic for the day. And now, um, accessibility, um, You know, different people who have different levels of functionality. Um, you know, as people start getting older, like me, reading really small font sizes is harder on the eyes. Um, you know, some people might, you know, have a tremor, and so it's hard for them to be you know, very precise. Um, and is actually people who are blind that use it, that use smart smartphones, um, and so both Android and iOS give us ability to add um, appropriate annotations and marks, etc., to make it easier for people um, with different levels of ability to interact with your application. Um, we need it and talk back so it will the application will they can ask you know basically what what what's on the screen or what's on, what's on the screen. Um, the obvious things are um, having large text so people you know, eyes are getting old or for eyesight can see better. Um, we can, you know, um, touch and hold to have a delay so they can, um, if, if you have a slight tremor, um, you don't, I mean, that's your wrong spot immediately. That doesn't figure until they touch and hold for a while. Um, so a number of things we can do. Um, for talk back, so we need audio descriptions. And we also need directions, right? So um, Android needs to know, you know, if I'm looking at this widget, should I go to the left or the right or up or down from the widget to tell the user what's going on? Um, and add audio descriptions, right? Um, Content description, we add it to, you know, you know, buttons and image views, um, and text. Um, and when the user turns on accessibility, um, talk back to them, um, basically read those descriptions and um, 
verbally read them out for the user. Um, write a text and provide a hint attribute. Um, again, if someone's not seeing the screen, um, just a text field, they have no idea what goes in there. But if you give a hint, well, enter your name, enter your address, enter your phone number, um, you know, then Android can tell them what goes in that particular uh, text view, write a text, um, and then enter the right information. Um, Android UI controls are probably if you, if you create your own control, own new controls, own new widgets, then you need to make sure that's that set. Controlling the focus order. Um, now here's how I can specify the order in which focus goes. Um, you know, but by indicating what, what, where, where to go next. You go, you know, for down, what would we go to? Um, and again, when you go into Android Studio, you can set this in the GUI builder. Um, on the left hand pane. You know, so here's an example of my, here's an edit text, and it's sort of fine. Next focus is, you know, ID text, um, which is this one here. You probably won't be creating any custom, you know, custom, well, the custom view. Um, you know, here's some things you need to do to make it accessible. And as I expected, um, and a little early. So what was the big topic I wanted to talk about? Um, today, um, next time I'll talk about testing applications and some other tools. Any questions? Vivian? <laughs> You're calling me out. <laughs> oh, just, um, I have a list of participants and yours lit up, so I look like you're about to just say something. No, okay. I'm good, yeah. Okay. In my case, um, I'll see everyone on Thursday. <clears throat> Professor? Yeah. How does the whole credit, no credit thing work with this course? Um, okay, that's a good question. <clears throat> so, um, the, yeah, you know, the president sent email out, I guess it was yesterday, and the chair asked that I do the same thing, so I did. Um, you know, the university is allowing people to um, and the regular university changed grades to credit no credit and also dropped courses. Um, they sent that basically the drop date. Actually, I'm not sure how it's going to work on this course because um, this is not through the regular university and the College of Studies hasn't. Oh, so some information about that. Um, in general, um, in general, for a, a regular graduate student, 
taking a course, credit, no credits. If they're going to get a C or better, um, probably doesn't make any sense. Um, because if you take a course, credit, no credit, you need to get a B or better to get credit. If you get a B minus or a C plus or a C, then you won't get credit for the course in terms of um, applying to your master's degree. Okay, and another question is regards to the master's exams. I know that till August, but do you foresee, I don't know, I'm pretty sure you can't talk now because you don't know what's going to happen later. But do you see if this continues, then we will have to still go take the exam or? Um. That is something I've worried about. Um, I, at this point in time, the um, university has not given me any, any indication of what they're thinking about during the fall. I did read, I don't know, a few days ago in the San Diego Union that both UCSD and San Diego State are considering that having to remain all courses online in the fall is a possibility, but they've not made any decision. Um, also, um, the governor of California could basically tell them what to do. So if the governor says they're going online, then we stay online. Um, the, the hard the issue is um, if we're still not allowed to meet in large groups, so campus remains closed and classes are going to be online, then what do we do with the master's exam in August? Um, and to be honest, I have no idea um, what we'll do, um, in part because how do you give exams remotely? Um, you know, that, that'll be really tough to set up. Um, you know, once exams go remote, then you really have no idea um, who's taking the exam, um, how many people are helping them. Um, so I'm At this point, I even haven't bothered bringing up the chair or the other graduate advisor to worry about because we're still trying to get through the semester and we'll take it as it goes. And okay, yeah, I figured that. Yeah. We don't know what decision to make yet, so. For yeah, the school. yeah. Makes sense. Also, also, I don't. You know, it's hard to imagine um, how to run a university for a long time, having to be remote. Um, there are a lot of classes that you need to be there. I mean, how do you take a chemistry lab course remotely? You can't, right? And also, you know, for chemistry and you know, biology and, you know, some subjects those labs are critical. Um, on the other hand, it's hard to imagine um, what's going to happen when you fit, you know, 60 people cramming into a room for an hour and 15 minutes. Um, what happens if two or three of those people are infected and don't know it and they're breathing in everyone? So I just don't know. And when we, when we get close to the time, somebody will know. Um, and you know, then we'll let students who are taking the exam know what's happening. Okay. 
Uh, I'm I'm guessing we'll just expect emails from you or from the computer or any science team. Um. Yeah, if, about the master's. Well, I would anticipate that um, the university is going to let students know what's going to happen in the fall, um, and they need to decide sometime in the summer before before students start showing up on campus, if they're, if they're going to be closed, right? They have to let all, all the people who live on the dorms know that in advance, otherwise they'll show up and... So they, at some point in the summer, they have to let us know. Um, so if we're being closed or we're having, we're meeting on campus, um, they will tell you that. Um, and once that's determined, then I will be sending out emails indicating um, what's going to happen to the map of the exam. Okay, sounds good to me. Okay. Uh, a lot of questions. Yeah. Well, thank you. Sure. Okay, I think um, unless there are any more questions, we can. Any class a few minutes early? Sounds good. Good night. Thank you. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night.